So first of all, a very, very warm welcome uh, to Diversifying Victorian Studies from Theory to Method, which is a collaboration between the Institute for English Studies um, at Senate House and the Vi Victorian Diversities Research Network, which is a ped pedagogic initiative that my colleague Adine is going to say a little bit more about in a bit, and which we hope many of you here will want to be involved in. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Lara Atkin, and I'm a lecturer in Victorian Literature at the University of Kent, and a member of the Centre for Indigenous and Settler Colonial Studies at Kent as well. Now, before I hand over to Claire Lees, the head of the Institute of English Studies, to say a few words about the IES's interest in this area, and what, of what we might term, for want of a better word, anti-racist pedagogies, um, I'm just going to briefly outline the format um, for tonight, or this afternoon, or possibly this morning, if you're even further afield. So after Claire's welcome, we're going to have presentations from our roundtable participants, Adine Agnew, Carrie Nagai and Brian Fong, who I'm really thrilled to have here with us um, to share their experiences and reflections on widening, undisciplining and diversifying their research and teaching in Victorian studies. In the interest of keeping the conversation focused, I'll just briefly introduce the titles of their talks and put their bios in the chat. And then we're going to have responses to them talks and the, some opening questions from our two, two respondents, Chloe Osborne and Emma Barnes. And after the discussion, um, we, we want, we're going to open up it up to the floor. So everyone who's here today has the chance to respond to the roundtable discussion and to share your own experiences and resources that have helped you to diversify your teaching and research in any fields pertaining to any region or aspect of what of the global 19th century. With the support of Elizabeth Durney at the Institute of English Studies, um, the IES has kindly agreed to host the Victorian Diversities webpage, which we hope will function as a hub for anyone interested in this area. We're going to compile a list of all the open access projects that we know of that offer resources for teaching the global 19th century and or open access formats of primary texts written in the 19th century by Black, Native, Indigenous and other non-European peoples. So if you've got a project that we should add to this list, please do um, add it in the chat and I'll make sure it makes it onto the web page. Um, and I'd also very much welcome anyone who reaches out to me at any time with any suggestions um, of other projects to add to the list. And I'll, I'll put my email in the chat now. And I'm just going to uh, pass over to Claire Lees here, who's the director of the Institute of English Studies, who's going to say a little bit more about the IES and, and what's going on from their side. Thanks very much, Lara, and welcome all. I'm so pleased to be able to join you, and I'm so pleased that this event has um, taken off. It's, it's, it's great to see you all. Um, as Lara said, I'm director of the Institute of English Studies here at the School of Advanced Study in Senate House, uh, University of London, where I'm also vice dean. Um, and by academic training, I'm a medievalist. So, um, um, like the 19th century, uh, 19th century studies, um, which the Institute of English Studies has long supported, medieval studies is another area that the Institute of English Studies has long supported, and like the 19th century, as some of you may already know, medieval studies itself has been actively involved in many of the conversations about decolonial, um, decolonizing uh, settler uh, studies and indigeneity. Um, and it's very exciting to be able to listen and bring these two groups together. Um, at the Institute of English Studies, I, I'm now in my fourth year as director, and I made a promise to myself and the Institute that we need it to think very, very hard about, and these, these are terms that are open to challenge, I understand, but we were going to think very hard about inclusion, um, diversity, equality, um, throughout all our practices um, on day, in day-to-day -day business, but also as a national center for research in English studies to do what we can to support initiatives throughout um, across um, uh, uh, the, the nation, the devolved nations, and indeed internationally. And I see diversifying Victorian studies as part of that initiative. Together with our partners, the English Association, University English, the Postcolonial Studies uh, Association, and UEA, we are supporting also something that is called, um, an initiative called Decolonizing the Discipline, 
Uh, we're thinking very hard about research and teaching. We've had a number of events already. It's been a challenge getting this off the ground during the pandemic, but even more important that we get this off the ground during the pandemic. Um, and indeed, our launch was supposed to be in 2020 um, at a conference called English Shared Futures, which will be happening in July, July 8th and 9th. I think um, Elizabeth Durnley will put a link to the conference in the chat and we will be hosting a reception um, and an informal networking opportunity there. We also have a website that will be going more live um, at, that, um, at that conference. So it's taken us a couple of years. The work, however, in my view, I have learned is continuous. It doesn't have an end. Um, it, it affects all, all the work that we do. Um, and it's absolutely critical in terms of our teaching, um, both undergraduates and in the case of um, IES, Institute of English Studies, most critically postgraduates, early career and researchers. So um, diversifying and transforming research is absolutely integral to our agenda as it is yours. And we have a lot to learn from each other and we have a lot to learn from you. So I hope that I'm looking forward to the panelists and I really um, want to, to see this go forward, and I hope that it will bear fruit in many ways as a collaboration. Thanks very much, Laura. I'll pass really? it to you now. Thanks so much, Claire. Well, without further ado, um, I, I think we should, um, we should begin our, 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 our roundtable discussion. Um, so I'm absolutely uh, delighted to be able to hand over now to Adine Agni, from, um, who's a senior lecturer at Kingston University specialising in transnational and global approaches to Victorian book literature. Her first book, Imperial Women Writers in Victorian India, was published in 2017 in, by Palgrave, and she's currently working on a project on transnational and anti-colonial discourses in front of Siekla, India, and is a principal investigation, invest, investigator on the Victorian Diversities Research Network, which she's going to tell you a little more about now. Thank you, Lara. Um, yeah, it's such a pleasure to be here today, to have the opportunity to talk to you about our network um, and just to, to share this event with so many, so many wonderful colleagues. Um, the diversification of Victorian studies is, is a real convergence for me of sort of personal and professional interests. Um, it's a way to resolve, I think, a kind of long-standing internal conflict um, that I'm always, always grappling with. Um, I was brought up as, as Irish uh, in Belfast during the euphemistically uh, named Troubles. Um, and at this time within my communities, British culture, Britishness more generally, was often seen as, as a tool of oppression. Uh, that was complicit in the marginalization of, of my own kind of Irish identity of my home, my home culture, as it were. Um, at the same time, uh, during these formative years, I was also an avid reader of English classics of, of you know, largely from the 19th and, and early 20th century literature, uh, or from the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, and all the while still kind of feeling that somehow I didn't quite belong to these stories or that those stories didn't quite belong to me. Um, it wasn't until much later, uh, sort of during my, sort of the latter part probably of my undergraduate studies, that I really came to understood how actually by studying the 19th century, I could really explore uh, the complex power dynamics of, of those, those kind of early feelings uh, about uh, British literature, British culture. Um, and then later again, uh, as I came to kind of research and uh, to research the 19th century, to teach the 19th century, especially, um, especially the sort of 19th century India, I came to sort of understand and appreciate that of course, 19th century literature was actually incredibly diverse. Uh, that there was that Victorian readers around the world had access to a wide range of voices, a variety of texts, uh, a variety of experiences, um, but that these uh, or a, a large number of these voices, these texts have become um, and indeed were marginalised from kind of canons and curriculums, um, and that this is kind of I suppose 
what our network wants to address. It wants to kind of bring those those voices back into uh, back into our our kind of reading uh, once again. Uh, we want the network to be an access uh, for students, uh, for teachers, and for lecturers in the nineteenth century who wish to pursue uh, teaching and or research uh, of historical writers of colour um, and writers from other, other marginalised communities. Uh, we want to explore engagement uh, with contemporary Indigenous scholars and scholarship, um, particularly but not solely uh, around issues of, of race and empire. And we want to really uh, to use the network as well as a way to encourage this kind of work amongst our wider academic and educational communities, among colleagues who perhaps don't have that interest uh, or that expertise already. The project um, has been in gestation for quite a few years. Uh, like Claire was just saying, <laughs> there's a, always a lot of challenges in getting things off the ground. Um, and during this time, uh, over the last few years, we've seen some really amazing initiatives get up and running already. Um, some of our speakers today you know, contribute to those um, projects like uh, Undisciplining the Victorian Classroom, uh, South African Modernism, uh, One More Voice, um, and, and, and many others um, are doing really great work in this, in this field. Um, and we, of course, do not want to replicate or simply duplicate work that's already being done. Um, but we want to align ourselves um, with these projects. We want to contribute to um, and to the work that they're already doing um, because we share their desire to introduce less studied Victorian era texts into the classroom and to think about new and ethical ways in which we can teach the, the, the more familiar texts. We also feel like it's really important that we have a UK based network um, that can respond to particular issues and challenges uh, that we face here. And that can be the voice of the UK in the global, global debates um, about the wider issues of um, diversifying decolonizing, undisciplining um, debates that, of course, include um, issues around the, the, the kind of language that we're using to talk about this as well. Um, and so we want to challenge, um, alongside, as I say, our fellow projects, we want to challenge contemporary neoliberal values uh, and undo neo-imperial cultures within education so that the discipline of English can move beyond the colonial legacy that arguably still characterizes 19th century studies. I'll say a little bit just about what I see as the specific challenges uh, facing us here uh, in the UK, um, and then uh, briefly um, how, how we as a network um, hope, to, hope to, to, face, to face those challenges. Um, Obviously, the UK, like everywhere else, has its own particular history when it comes to race and empire, nation and national identity. Um, and this aspect of British history in the 19th century also becomes um, the history of English literature as the object of study. And so it really seems to me that we as Victorianists are really perfectly placed to to centralize questions about canons and curriculum, um, to, to kind of, to take a kind of active role along with our students and, and through our research, to think through these, um, through the issues of canonicity and, and, and curriculums. And so as many of you uh, will, uh, will know, the study of English literature in the UK came about um, partly as a broader desire to strengthen dominant English middle-class values by conferring a cultural education upon the masses who were not trained in the classics, um, as a, also as kind of a way to find a replacement for religion as a, as a mode of, of social cohesion. Uh, for many, as Terry Eagleton argues, uh, literature provided effective values and basic mythologies which could and would bind the people together. Prominent figures like Matthew Arnold proclaimed that reading the likes of Milton and Shakespeare would promote sympathy and fellow feeling among all classes um, through a kind of high-minded contemplation of eternal truths um, and universal human values. And of course, um, at the same time, by promoting what we all have in common, literature could simultaneously obscure uh, differences. Uh, so differences like uh, living and working conditions. Um, 
Reading also by nature as an individual pursuit could preclude collective and indeed rebellious action. And this, of course, has its most significant impact on the potentially rebellious working classes in the 19th century. Literature could then essentially and importantly impart to the working classes the moral riches of bourgeois civilization, impress upon them a reverence for middle class achievements and instill a cohesive national pride. And therefore English as an academic subject uh, in the UK was first institutionalized not in universities but in mechanics institutions, working men's colleges and the extension lecturing circuits. Around the same time, it also became part of civil service exams. And this ensured then that the servants of British imperialism were similarly armed with the kind of neatly packaged version of their own cultural treasures that they could head overseas, uh, secure uh, in their national identity and able to, to display a sense of their superiority uh, to colonial subjects. Arguably then, as uh, Eagleton states, what was at stake in English studies was less, um, less English literature than English literature. Um, I hope the emphasis is clear without Eagleton's italics. Um, and of course, this is even more important uh, in the empire itself, specifically in India, where as Gauri Vasanathan has shown, the discipline of English came into its own. Viswanathan demonstrates that uh, English as a study of culture and not simply the study of language actually appeared as a subject in the curriculum of the colonies even before it was institutionalized at home. And that this, con this context was crucial to the notable emphasis on the Englishness of literature. She explains that in the wake of uh, the Charter Act of 1813, Britain had assumed a kind of new responsibility towards uh, Native education, um, using a kind of uh, shifting from Orientalist to Anglicist uh, uh, practices and principles of governance, um, as are, were sort of infamously now uh, outlined in Macaulay's Minute on Indian Education which denigrated Indian languages and literature while elevating the civilizing properties of English culture. Macaulay's ideas, uh, and of course there were many others at the same time who were similarly circulating these ideas. He just, his, I say, his minute has become a kind of easy way into them. Um, these ideas were broadly accepted. And so in the 1820s, um, while the classical curriculum still existed in, in, or still reigned in, in England, Indian students were fed a diet of dead white Englishmen, the likes of Pope, Richardson, Addison, and Shakespeare. Therefore, uh, Viswanathan argues that English literary study had its beginnings as a strategy of containment, that it was authority veiled in the guise of a humanistic project of enlightenment. And we seem to be returning uh, to a similar place um, and similar ideologies, um, particularly within uh, schools and the school curriculum in the UK. The school's curriculum currently has a renewed focus uh, on canonical British uh, texts, British writers, with the deliberate exclusion of other writers in writing, especially uh, writers of colour. Um, thankfully, uh, there are many teachers who are pushing back against this, um, who are trying to find ways um, within the, the curriculum to introduce uh, historical writers of colour um, and a lot of teachers we're seeing more and more teachers I think coming to us as university staff for help with this. Um, this is because in the universities there is more freedom, um, at least superficially, uh, more freedom in terms of setting syllabi um, and for the most part um, I, I believe here in the UK Literature departments generally agree upon the need for some kind of diverse curriculum. This predominantly takes place through dedicated modules on post-colonial literature um, and theory, um, modules on Anglophone literatures, um, which are broadly perceived to be kind of a sort of 20th, 21st century uh, development, uh, or uh, through the inclusion of Black and Asian writers on, on uh, contemporary literature modules. But our more canonical um, and historical courses remain largely uh, untroubled still by the calls for greater diversity, at least in terms of our primary reading. 
Um, so I think we've done a lot of really great work here, actually, in the UK, uh, when it comes to addressing the kind of ideological method, methodological approach to Victorian literature. Uh, there is a strong decolonizing impulse um, to kind of talk about race and empire, to look at the margins and the silences, um, to tackle kind of contrapuntal readings of white, you know, of white writers of empire. But there hasn't been any real substantial, substantial challenge to what we teach as in the core texts themselves. Um, we're still, as I say, very much dominated in terms of our primary reading lists uh, by, by white and Western authors. Um, of course, uh, we absolutely do not want diversity to be simply a text bo tick box exercise. And there's a lot of work still uh, as I think some of my fellow panel members are gonna speak about today, there's a lot of work still to be done on, on those methodologies. Um, but the lack of engagement uh, with 19th century writers of color and other marginalized communities uh, mimics the structures of a liberal humanism and colonial modernity that deny the existence of moral and literary value for those writers um, positioned outside a kind of metropolitan center, be that literally or figuratively. And I think it perpetuates a kind of gatekeeping still of, of, uh, of, uh, of British culture, of British literature and culture. It perpetuates an ongoing system whereby we don't teach historical writers of colour, so students don't learn about them. Uh, they, there are, they don't write their dissertations or produce PhD projects on them. Uh, Victorian studies as a whole remains, as I say, very uh, very white. And we see this often, I think, as well at Victorian literature conferences, where there will be a, panels on race and empire and colonial literature. But, but the majority of the writers that we talk about are, are still very much dominated uh, by, by whiteness and, and, uh, and by Western, uh, Western writers, Western texts. Ruvani uh, Ranasina recently stated in, uh, in her editorial on decolonizing, 19, uh, decolonizing literature that it was imperative now that we tackle this de-whitening, uh, that we tackle this uh, issue. Uh, she states that the de-whitening of British literature needs to be part of our revision of the narrative of, modern British, uh, of the modern British curriculum. She writes that it's time to move beyond tracing the presence of migrant writers and activists and intellectuals and focus instead on their impact. That there's a pressing need to document and highlight these thinkers, remarkable and yet still overlooked formative contributions to national history, to British culture, literature, politics and identity. But how do we do this? Uh, how do we introduce these contributions uh, to our modules? Um, from our initial uh, work uh, for the network, um, I think what we have learned uh, so far is that the biggest obstacle for many people in terms of introducing this material to their, to their teaching is a, is a lack of familiarity with the material, not really knowing uh, how or where to make the interventions. Because many of us that are now teaching Victorian literature did not grow up with the diverse curriculums um, that, that we're now calling for for our students. And therefore, unless we specialize in this area, it tends to be, you know, really unfamiliar. Um, and of course, there are huge issues, uh, as we all know now, uh, with academic workloads, um, where we all face challenges uh, in terms of our time, uh, um, especially then when it comes to kind of having to constantly try to update our reading lists in relation to, you know, the, the kind of new, uh, new work in our field. Um, and so while there's a a real desire to make those changes, as I say, people are really struggling with the time and the ability to do so. And so this is where our network hopefully can come in and make an intervention. We want to bring people here together so that we can all learn from, from each other um, and from other um, areas within English studies uh, and within historical studies, within 19th century studies. We can all learn together about the wonderful writers of colour from the 19th century. Of, 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 we can learn together about the variety of texts from marginalised communities, and we can discuss the various ways that we can teach them. 
our research network will aim uh, to do this uh, by creating uh, what is called a community of practice as defined by Etienne Wenger uh, and developed by Siobhan Campbell and Meg Jensen. Wenger identifies the key principles of, of a community of practice as shared repertoires, mutual engagements, and a continual renegotiation of a joint enterprise. When these aspects are present uh, within a community of practice, they can produce and create knowledge, um, especially related to a specific field, and they have the potential, he argues, to produce change, to produce a lasting change. And so the network will, utify, will utilize uh, Wenger's um, theory of a, a kind of ongoing, collaborative, inclusive, and bottom-up approach um, that often, or that rarely actually takes place in the English literature. Again, we tend to do a lot of our work um, independently on our own. Um, and so we want to bring people together in ways that align with the kind of ethical principles that seek to destabilize hierarchies of knowledge and value systems. We want to host lots more events uh, like this one, uh, but also to put together a series of reading groups and work workshops where we can share resources, practices and methodologies, and importantly, foreground discussions of less familiar writers from the 19th century. Together, it's hoped we will produce uh, new knowledge, uh, new research and change perceptions of British literary history. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that, Adeen. That I mean, that that was a really sweeping contribution that 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 speaks to a lot of things um, about how bound up our discipline is uh, with history and with um, national identity. And um, there, there's a lot of um, unlearning we need to do, as well as diversification, um, in order to achieve these things. So, so thank you for that that fantastic start. I'm now going to pass over to Carrie Nagai, who is a lecturer in Victorian literature at the University of Kent. She's the author of two monographs, Empire and Analogies, Kipling, India and Ireland, which was published in 2006, and Imperial Beast Fables, Cosmopolitanism and the British Empire, which was published in 2020. She's a founding member of the Kent Animal Humanities Network and has edited a collection of essays entitled Cosmopolitan Animals in 2015 um, with Animal Studies um, colleagues at Kent. Carrie's going to talk to us about fabling Victorian studies. Over to you, Carrie. Okay, thank, thank you so much, Laura. Uh, just let me share the screen. Okay. Um, can you see the slide? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. Okay, so thank you so much again for the, like Lara for inviting me. And then, uh, so today I'm going to talk about the uh, fables. And uh, I hope this is, makes a very interesting case study to diversify uh, the Victorian studies. So fable is according to the OED, a short story devised to convey some useful lesson, especially one in which animals or inanimate things as the speakers or actors. Well, sometimes I have been fascinated with this literary genre, especially as I work in the field of animal studies. It is a genre in which animals take center stage and are allowed to talk and teach humans useful lessons. I have, I have even written a book on it called Imperial Beast Fables in which I explored the 19th century fascination with non-European beast fables. I'm a Kipling scholar, and my main example is Jungle Books, which I believe was inspired by Kipling's strong interest in non-European fables, as well as non-human animals in the colonial space. In our effort to diversify and decolonize Victorian studies, it seems to me important that we take the fable seriously. I am conscious that during the Victorian period, the fable was a minor and marginalized genre compared to novels and poetry. And it is rarely included in a standard Victorian studies curriculum. 
but the fable once was, to quote Thomas Noel in his book, Theories of the Fable in the 18th century, highly regarded as either a literary genre with educational utility or an educational tool with the inherent attractiveness of literature. It was only in the late 18th century that the fable started losing its significance as a respectable genre. Uh, Horst Dorber's Fables, Less and Less Fabulous, is one of the few books which discusses the roles of fables in the 19th century. And its opening paragraph explains uh, these circumstances well. At the first sight in the 19th century Europe, the fables, Aesopian or parabolic, would seem to have lost much of its importance. It had flourished in the 17th and 18th centuries. When La Fontaine's fables came out between 1668 and 1694, Gay's fables appeared in 1727 and 1738, and Lessing published the three books of his fabling in 1759. From the Romantic period onward, however, traditional fables and their modern imitations and variation alike went through a sharp decline in prestige in Germany, France, and England. Around the year 1800, there was an already talk among critics of the death of the fable. <coughs> it is then important to ask why the fable suddenly declined or even died in the late 18th century. Why people stopped trusting it as a literary genre worthy of serious consideration. This is especially so because the fable is an international genre and almost every culture has its own fables. Thus, by dismissing the fable as a minor genre, we are failing to take seriously different cultural and linguistic traditions and our connections with them. I think it is pertinent to think of the fable in our reassessment of Victorian studies. But for this, we need to first understand how the Victorians treated the fables. This quote by Doruba importantly starts with the word, the word at first sight. His book goes on to explore ways in which the fable, despite being no, no, no longer a serious genre, continued to be popular in 19th century England. Among them is the concept of a post-Darwinian fable, which refers to the way in which Darwinian theory of the evolution changed what we read into an animal fable. After Darwin, it is no longer possible to read an animal fable purely as human fable. It inevitably reminds us of the truth of our bestial origin. The concept of the post-Darwinian fable is further ex explored by the Chris Dante's recent book, Animal Fables After Darwin, Literature, Speciesism, and Metaphor. This is a great book, and I highly recommend that you read it. Both Dolber and Dante discuss 19th century fables in the European context, whereas my book, as I have already just mentioned, focuses on non-European animal fables. My assumption is that the fable genre, once a respectable, respected literary genre written for adults, transformed into children's literature and anthropo anthropological materials. The Victorian classics fables, such as Ease of Fables and Leonard, Leonard the Fox, were among the most popular children's books of the day. No European fables discovered by Europeans in the colonial space were hugely popular too. Europeans, settlers, immigrants, missionaries, philologists, explorers, etc., collected non European fables wherever they went. And the European colonial narratives often included some animal fables told by natives. These stories were highly valued as anthropological objects, which hold the keys to the history of mankind. My book explores the European obsession with fables as an anthropological object and how this shaped colonial relations. Wilhelm Bleek's Leonardo the, the Fox 
in South Africa, 1864, is a good example of this. Bleek is a German philologist who went to South Africa in the mid 19th century and worked for Sir George Gray, the governor of Cape Colony. This book dedicated to Gray is a collection of annual fables told by Khoi Khoi people, then called Hottentot in the Cape Colony. In comp compiling this book, he was helped by uh, Reverend Crawling, a German missionary stationed at the Great Namukaland, who collected the Khoi Khoi fables in response to Bleek's request. Bleek, with his sister-in-law, Lucy Lloyd, went on to collect Bushman folklore, about which, of course, Lara's new book, Writing the South African Sun, is the best place to go to, to learn more about it. I have put an image of the first fable to show that the book collects simple Ethiopian style animal fables, and that by Denard the Fox in South Africa, he meant the jackal tales, which he found in abundance in South Africa. Indian animal fables played a significant role in the 19th century discussion of the fable, especially as many people, such as the influential comparative philologist Max Muller, believed that all stories originated in India. In particular, the Panchatantra, also known as Pitapais or Pirupais fables, the oldest known collection of Indian animal fables, was studied by many Oriental scholars. Indeed, many eminent Orientalists began their careers by studying or translating this text. <clears throat> so here are three examples of the translation that Hitopadesha is a, a later version of the Panchatantra. These texts were also used by Europeans to learn Indian languages. For instance, Richard Francis Burton, a talented linguist and translator who is said to have been able to speak 20 old languages, recommended that young scholars of Oriental languages should begin with fables like the Panchatantra or Aesop fables. Here is uh, the, the right one, uh, right hand side. Um, it's a Barton's literal translation of a Hindustani version of Pirupe's fables, which he produced when he was still a young soldier in India. It was as if British Orientalism emerged out of the world of talking animals, being trained in to quote Edwin Arnold, another translator of the Hitopat Gesha, the wit, the morality, and the philosophy of this beast in India. No European animal fables played a significant role in the making of 19th century racial theories. Firstly, comparative philologists and folklorists study the fables to establish connections between languages and culture. So when in 1881, the American author Joel Chandra Harris published Angulimus, which is a collection of animal fables told among the Black Am Americans or the plantations, he was bombarded by queries and comments from philologists and folklorists who knew similar fables told in other parts of the world, which included India, the Caribbean, the Americas, South Africa, and of course, Africa. These scholars traced the migration of fables to work out the history of the evolution and dissemination of the human race. Some philologists believe that these American African fables originated in India from Native Americans or were told by their white masters, ignoring the fact that these stories most likely follow the movement of the African slaves and therefore form the important part of their heritage. Secondly, evolutionary anthropologists such as Edward Barnett Tyler theorized the concept of the beast of fables. According to him, the fable is the oldest form of literature created when humans were yet to learn to distinguish themselves from other animals. So to the savage mind, the semi-human beast is no fictitious creature invented to preach to a sneer, 
he is all but the reality. These two fables are not, non, non, not non, nonsense to men who ascribe to the lower animals a power of speech and look on them as partaking of moral human nature to men in whose eyes any hyena or wolf might, may probably be man hyena or werewolf. Such beliefs belong even now to half mankind, and among such the beast stories had their first home. No European fables were therefore used to substantiate the highly racist Eurocentric narratives of human evolution and progress from the most primitive animal-like non-European savages to the most civilized Europeans. To rethink and re-examine the rules which favor played in the Victorian period is to be aware of and counter the problematic, problematic racist discourse and assumptions which arguably are still operating today. But is more, the way in which Europeans started collecting non-European fables was a way of silencing non-Europeans. But they were communicating by telling these tales. Indeed, Europeans, by turning the fable in folklore or anthropological text, i.e. dead objects, trying to kill the living potentials of the fables, as that which opens up a narrative space of colonial encounter, translation, exchange, and negotiation, for instance. It is important to remember that the fable can be a highly political and satiric junk too, and that might be why Europeans were quick to run to dismiss them as anthropological project. Luckily, we have many resources with which to think differently about Victorian non-European fables. For instance, I have already mentioned the idea of a post-Darwinian fable. Fables which feature local animals as the main characters are perfect ways to consider human-animal relationships. Indeed, the fable has been cited as an alternative form to novels and literary realisms, which many critics have argued have been complicit in the history of colonialism, environmental destruction, and global crisis. Of course, any rewriting of Victorian fables should take indigenous people's view into account and post-colonial studies. One contribution that Victorian world made to, study, made to the study of fables is the recognition of the fact that the fables, just like people, migrate and become part of wherever they in, end up in. To think of fables is to follow the global movement of people and the complex way in which our lives, tradition, and the future are entangled, entangled together. I'm finishing this talk by mentioning Karen Brixon's Out of Africa. Sorry, this is not a Victorian text. Uh, this semi-autobiographical fiction is based on Karen Brixon's time as a settler in Kenya from 1914 to 1931, published in 1936. But this is a typical colonial fiction in which African people figure as childlike and animal-like. According to Gugi Juongo, it is one of the most dangerous books ever written about Africa because it represents racism as love, and he is particularly upset by Brixon's description of her Kikuyu cook, Kamante, as a civilized dog. But Kamante happened to be a very talented artist, and when he had the chance to rewrite Brixon's Out of Africa from his point of view, he richly illustrated his narrative with animal images, which were also accompanied by a series of animal fables, a mixture of Aesop fables and African folklore, which I believe he discussed with Brixon and which he was hoping to translate into Swahili. Kamante might still be performing the role of a childlike, animal-like native, which the colonizer expected from him, but he is restoring the fable as a living germ into a conversation through which Africa might be able to rewrite colonial narrative to reclaim their power. So this is 
well, interesting um, thing, uh, example to think about. Okay, so yeah, I think I'll finish this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kari. That was an incredibly rich paper um, full of lots of different ways in which um, genres are kind of cross-cultural circulation is something we talk about and we often talk about it in a very celebratory way. Um, but there are also, I think your talk really highlighted the ways in which um, knowledge systems operate to appropriate and domesticate forms that um, other cultural forms and fit them, um, European knowledge systems operate to do that. Uh, to fit them into their own highly charged racial narratives. Um, and I think your, your talk spoke to that really, really powerfully, uh, as well as giving those fascinating counterexamples at the end. So thank you. Um, moving on now to Ryan D. Fong, who is the Associate Professor of English at Kalamazoo College. Um, his book manuscript, Unsettling, Indigenous Literatures and the Work of Victorian Studies, is under co contract with Sunley Press right now. And he is one of, one of the founding developers of Undisciplining the Victorian classroom. He is also currently the faculty fellow of the Arcus Centre for Social Justice Leadership, working on projects to integrate Indigenous studies throughout the Kalamazoo College curriculum and to build eth ethical relationships with local Potawatomi tribes. Um, Brian's going to speak to the subject of uh, uh, subjects that he's titled On Becoming Unsettled. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and, and to be in such esteemed company. So um, my presentation today is, is less a formal talk than a sharing of thoughts, reflections, and experiences of engaging Indigenous studies as a Victorianist. Um, my hope is that these comments can set the stage for a conversation, a robust conversation that will take place after the respondents and, and amongst you all. Um, but there's a, a kind of recurring theme that, that runs throughout all my comments today, which is that I'm a learner, a struggler, um, as somebody who is, is very much in the process and will always be in the process of engaging in this work, um, rather than the authority who has kind of figured out the way, let alone a way, um, that, that I would want to prescribe um, to, to anyone else. Um, so I see this again as a process of, of co-learning, of unlearning, um, and, and imagining together what, what these more ethical relationships could be. Um, I, of course, need to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, which are made up of the Anishinaabe Moan speaking nations of the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. And where I am at in what's known as Kalamazoo, Michigan, I'm specifically on the reserve lands that were taken from the um, Machbinashwish band of Potawatomi um, in the 1827 Treaty of Chicago. So, excuse me, the Treaty of St. Joseph. Um, and this is really important to me as, as I think about my positionality, where, where I am physically on the land and location that I am, um, and to think about how that shapes the commitments and actions I can take as a mixed race Asian American settler um, in this particular place with the particular obligations that I have to the, the traditional keepers um, and owners of this land. So part of what I wanna do is, is kind of briefly trace a little bit of my intellectual trajectory. Um, and how that shaped my scholarly research and book project, how it shaped my teaching and my work here at Kalamazoo College with my students. Um, and then finally, briefly about a little bit about my work with Undisciplining the Victorian Classroom. Um, so in a broad way, I see all of my efforts as very much embedded in the critical discussions that people have already named that are taking place across what I call the British historical fields. Um, the call to undisciplined Victorian studies by Wong, Chatterjee and Christoph but also the work done by um, scholars and organizations in the bigger six, in BIPOC 18, in Shakes Race, in Race Before Race. I think it's, it's important to notice that, that in the British historical fields across these different periods, um, we're engaged in, in, in very resonant conversations. Um, and, and I see this as, as, a, as a widespread movement, if you will, um, of rethinking and, and relearning. Um, and as specifically as a scholar of color in Victorian studies, I'm deeply invested in confronting the histories that, that have already been laid out here, which is the, the deep imbrication of our own field and our discipline of study with the structures of settler colonialism, of white supremacy and imperialism, and to think about what it means to 
be working in a field that that has that that legacy? How much of that do we want to to retain? Um, if anything, how much do we really need to to, to scrap and reimagine? Um, and more accurately, to learn uh, from other fields that that quite frankly have longer and better histories of doing this work. Um, on an individual level, I also want to note that my investments and in particular interest in indigenous studies crystallized in a relationship that I developed with a former colleague of mine, Reed Gomez, um, and at the watershed moment of the No Dapple protests. Um, speaking with Reed as a Diné or Navajo writer and scholar, I became really aware of the limitations in my understandings of empire and the gaps in my training as a Victorianist. Um, and I think that that's, this kind of very personal relationship is, is one that's really deeply important to me, that as we read together, as we talked with one another, that is what really allowed me to, and, and, and catalyzed the process of what I call breaking the frame, of thinking about the frames that had defined what it meant to be trained as a Victorianist and realizing the limitations of that and the need to break them. So for me, especially in my scholarly work, um, breaking the frame means thinking beyond what Marjorie Fee has called representations criticism, um, which is the, the kind of appearance of indigenous um, knowledge and, and peoples and communities in Western canonical texts and how they're represented. Um, I don't wanna diminish that work at all. I think it's been deeply important and, st and there's still much to be done on that, um, but it can only tell us so much about the way that empire worked um, and also about the experiences and subjectivities of the indigenous communities who were occupied and most affected by colonial violence. Um, and so in, in breaking the frame and moving away from representation criticism, what I'm really emphasizing are concepts that Leanne, Bennett, um, Leanne Simpson has called indigenous brilliance um, and intelligence and what Gerald Visner has called survivance. And this is about the, the ongoing life and presence and relevance of indigenous ways of knowing and indigenous communities um, throughout the 19th century and into the present day. And part of my guiding question is how do we develop frameworks or use frameworks um, to create a, a greater perception of survivance, indigenous um, brilliance and indigenous intelligence rather than just representations in the canon. Um, and I think that's a really important shift um, that we can learn a lot from the work of people like Visner and uh, Simpson, who are, are, are long respected and longstanding scholars in indigenous studies. Um, and, and to that note, you know, I just want to underscore that these are not new methodologies. These are not new conversations. Other fields have very much to teach us about these questions and concerns. So I'm thinking a lot about how do I position myself as a scholar in relation to these fields, not as somebody who's a Victorianist who's discovering new methods, who's, who's kind of um, striving to create kind of something novel, but rather somebody who's engaged in the process of building relation with a field and a set of scholars that already exist. Um, and this causes me to think very critically and self-reflexively about the tendency within academia for extraction. I think even as we look to other fields, there is a tendency in our, in our kind of trained modes of being is like, who can I study and bring over into my work in order to establish myself as an authority instead of asking the question of what are my ethical responsibilities to this knowledge that I'm citing and to the people and communities that are undergirding its production. Um, so instead of making the move to authority and mastery, part of what I wanna really think through is how I can be humble, how I can recognize the partiality of what I'm doing, um, and how I can use my work to stage collective conversations rather than position myself as the individual scholar who needs to come up with the answer. How do I, I see my work as part of engaging in the work of creating and fostering relations and understanding my, my place within that? Within my classrooms, um, the, this work of acknowledging and grappling and, and, and dealing with kind of where we are and how we're positioned is at the core of what, what I'm, I'm trying to do and, and stage for my students, especially around these issues. So to offer one particular example um, of this past fall, I was teaching our course, uh, which is a, a junior level course, um, a third year level course on 19th century women's literature. Um, and it's, it was developed and traditionally taught in a very canonical way where we kind of look at kind of the, the, the usual suspects, the, the major figures, which, which of course settled into um, canonical white um, British and American women. 
Um, and instead, what I wanted to do was, was really think about how can I do this work of undisciplining, um, creating relation, and, and while still recognizing the force and the place of, of the, the Victorian canon and the, the 19th century canon. So a couple of things that I did was in the very first week, what we started with were the treaties, one of which I already mentioned was the Treaty of St. Joseph in 1827, but we also talk about the Treaty um, of Chicago in 1821, and then the Treaty of Chicago in 1833. And those three treaties were really a really key part of the dispossession process of the Potawatomi communities in the, the location where we are in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Um, and significantly, 1833 is also the year of Kalamazoo College's founding. So we spent some time talking about that particular conjunction, what it means for our very existence as an institution at the same moment of, of indigenous dispossession and how those two things were absolutely interlinked within um, the story of the American Midwest. But count, uh, as a kind of counterpoint or, or um, kind of refraction point for, for that history, we then read the, um, some poems by Jane Schoolcraft Johnston, who was an Ojibwe writer who lived in what, what's now known as the, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Um, and we think about what was she doing? What was she writing, especially in, in the Ojibwe language? Um, how, what do her poems express that give us a different kind of perspective about survival and persistence and ongoing relevance, um, even at the moment of dispossession? And then in the first unit, what that sets the stage for is I organize the class in, into three units that are anchored by different volumes of Jane Eyre. So the first unit is, is the first volume of Jane Eyre where we talk about constructions of girlhood um, and specifically education. Um, and so we read that, that famous <laughs> first volume, talk about her experiences at Lowood and at Gateshead, but then we read it alongside um, Zitkala Shah's American Indian stories to think about her experience in the residential school system in, in the United States. Um, and then we frame that with readings by Leanne Simpson, specifically her essay, Land as Pedagogy, um, and Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass to talk about knowledge production and, and the Western Academy. And to, again, think about kind of what these two 19th century texts offer us of use of, of girlhood and, and education. And the, the discussion that emerges is, is really, was a really powerful one where we thought very deeply about narrative form, about kind of the use of the first person voice, about the ways in which education becomes a means um, to accessing self-knowledge and, and um, specifically through literacy and through, through writing and self-articulation. But what becomes really clear is the ways for Jane there's a kind of that that empowers and emboldens a kind of drive and movement towards greater authority, a greater sense of self-possession, and then ultimately possession of property. Um, that is very in striking contrast to Zitkala Shah's kind of movement um, constantly back to community and the ways in which education and, and kind of her own um, educative process is wrapped up in, in a desire to restore the bonds of community that were broken in the residential school system process. So it's, it's a really powerful way to think about kind of two sides um, with a sense of uh, two texts side by side with a sense of parity. And um, rather than just saying, um, um, you know, here's the canonical text and then here's something that we can kind of put in, in, in contrast to it. Instead, it's, it's two narratives that we treat side by side and read through and alongside one another. Um, of course, for me, what's really important to think about is how do we take this beyond just the, the classroom? Um, so how do I not only think about the ways that we engage in these discussions for the benefit of me, my, my largely settler, white settler students and the, the white settler institution of Kalamazoo College? Um, so there's a lot of efforts that I'm undertaking to push for the college as an institution um, to think about its commitment and relation to uh, and obligations to, to local Potawatomi um, communities. And the key question for me in this is how can the college contribute to indigenous futures? Not just learning and discussing indigeneity, but actually fostering indigenous futures. Um, and this looks, looks different in, in many different forms and, and of course needs to be driven by tribal leadership and, and, and articulation of their own concerns and needs. Um, but a lot of this is about undoing damage and undoing the long histories of damage that academic um, institutions um, have, have engaged in as a way of building trust. So one of the things that I'm doing is um, doing some work to ensure that, that our institution 
is NAG, NAGPRA compliant, uh, which is the, the particular law in the United States about um, um, uh, grave remains and restitution of cultural objects. Um, and this seems to me to be a, a salient point of, again, that kind of trust building process to say, we want to, this is a way of modeling and, 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 um, and engaging in, in kind of respectful relations as an entry point to then start thinking about financial structures of financial support, about mentorship, about nurturing um, deeper connections and, and longer connections with, with tribal communities. Um, in a conversation that I had with one uh, member of the, the Machibinashwish uh, tribe, she talked about how at many academic institutions, um, there are more remains and therefore ancestors at those institutions than there are living native students. Um, and that's a really sobering realization um, to, to think about what, what structures our obligations um, and, and the, the, the deep harms um, that we've, and, and the ways of undoing those, those kinds of deep harms. Um, just as a kind of final wrapping up point, you know, I wanna emphasize again that what I'm engaging in here is very localized. And I think that's, that's, that's a really important part of the process. I'm thinking about kind of where I am, how I can build relationships within my institution and within the communities where I am. Um, but it is just kind of one person, one institution's limited in process, ongoing mode of engagement and, and strategy making. Um, it's far from, from finished. And as I said, it takes collective work. I can't just do this in my, in my one book project or, or, or one class that I'm teaching. Um, the work of remaking Unsettling needs to be collective and bigger as we kind of confront the institutional challenges and also the affective challenges of this, what it means to really confront our, 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 our status um, and responsibility and, and role in these, these particular histories. And in that sense, you know, I see the work as uh, at UVC or in Disciplining the Victorian Classroom as deeply connected um, to this work at, at my institution, uh, which is about centering teaching, um, but also about centering who we lift up in, in the experience of teaching, to recognize the, the, the experiential expertise that, that scholars of color and vulnerably positioned scholars have um, that, that's, that's pedagogical knowledge that's really important, important um, for us to learn from, to acknowledge and lift, lift up that expertise, um, and also to engage in processes of reciprocity and care as we do this work. Um, just as I think about extractive practices when it comes to Indigenous communities, how do we think about reframing the work that we do even within the academy as, as not non-extractive? Um, how do we think about compensation? Um, in really scarce funding environments so that it, it's maybe not just money, um, but things that we can do that, that offer forms of, of care um, that it can invigorate us and the people that, that we're working with. Um, how do we be mindful of those challenges as well? And that's a deep part of this work. Um, and so again, it's marked by a commitment. It's marked by an emphasis on relation, uh, which is something that I draw from my work in, um, engaging with Indigenous Studies. And it's not about achievement or finality, but really engaging in this ongoing process of self-reflection and, and, um, and commitment. So thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you so much, Ryan. I mean, that, these were some really fantastic, great concrete personal examples of, of, what, um, the first, of what unsettling Victorian studies might look like in a particular context. And I think it's that, that everything you said about process and learning um, rather than mastering and extracting is just so so crucial um, for so many reasons um, I won't say any more I'm going to hand over now to our respondents um, Emma Barnes and Chloe Osborne Emma is a lecturer in 19th century and world literatures at the University of Salford and a research assistant on the AHRC funded South African modernisms project Emma has recently been awarded her PhD entitled plants animals land more than human relations and gendered survivance in early Indigenous women's writing. Uh, Chloe is um, a PhD candidate at Royal Holloway. She's on an AHRC funded doctoral project um, that um, involves colonial and post-colonial writing in the long 19th and 20th centuries. She's completing her thesis on, her thesis on the inter intersections and interplay between anthropological and literary discourses in representations of Oceania with a particular focus on critical indigenous theory and in the indigenous presences in Victorian 
Studies. And she has also held visiting fellowships at the Huntington Library and the Eccles Centre for American Studies at the British Library. So I'm going to hand over uh, first to Emma and then to Chloe to open up today's discussion. Hi everyone, um, thank you um, Lara for inviting me to uh, to speak today and respond um, to these three wonderful papers. Um, I kind of identify with each paper in, in different ways, um, I have to say, because um, like Aideen, I've been working with schools to try and um, decolonize the curriculum, if you will. Um, like Curry, I'm trying in my own research to think about these transcultural, transnational connections and think about um, the politics of form. And um, Ryan, I, I feel like you must have read without me knowing the first draft of my thesis talking about Carla Shah, Jane Johnson Schoolcraft. Um, I, my one of my earliest drafts was thinking about the Kalasar and, and the Jane Eyre text um, alongside each other. And amazing to hear that, you, that you've been doing that too. Um, so yeah, although um, on the surface, I think each paper was talking about, you know, something um, rather different. I think what really spoke to me from each of your papers is that, well, firstly, there is a multiplicity of ways that we can and should diversify Victorian studies. Um, but what it made clear was that this project, which as you've all stated, is an ongoing one, is a learning process, is that it's not just about what we teach or what we research, but about how we go about doing that, about the methods that we use to diversify or hopefully eventually decolonize, that it's not a case of, um, you know, going into schools and giving them, you know, text by writers of colour, uh, by black writers and leaving them to it. It's not a case of, you know, um, writing about a different text that we, you know, outside of the canon. It's about actually thinking about these frameworks in which we're using. Um, and the phrase that, that you used, Ryan, um, was breaking the frame, um, which I thought was really fascinating. And it reminded me of um, one of the most foundational papers, I think that if you're in indigenous studies, you'll know, which is um, Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang's decolonization is not a metaphor, um, in which they talk about um, decolonization cannot come into fruition in the pre-existing frames, which of course are um, underpinned by Western philosophy um, by, you know, Euro-American epistemological thought. Um, so it's, I think, breaking the frame or unsettling the frame or indisciplining, as we've talked about, is all key to thinking about not just what we are studying, but the means in which we are studying that and acknowledging that there is um, a multiplicity of truths, a multiplicity of cultural knowledges um, that are all valid and, and legitimate within academia although it's taken academia a very long time to, to realise that. Um, so my first question um, to you all, um, thinking about, you know, decolonization is not a metaphor, what we're talking about, you know, we can't just you put decolonization, oh, we're going to decolonise the curriculum, decolonise our mind, decolonise methods. And it is a tricky question that I've been grappling with throughout my research. But at what point does diversifying end and where does decolonizing begin that is a fabulous quite opener um who wants to start on that if you if if any i suppose everyone will need a few moments to reflect um but if anyone wants to just raise their hand or just unmute and step in i think it's probably the, the best way I'll go ahead and, <laughs> and start off um, thinking about this. I mean, I think in some ways it, it, you're, you're asking the question, right? <laughs> um, that, that so much of the, the focus um, in, in these, these conversations has, has rightly been for the, for the last couple of years on kind of expanding the canon, right? Of finding other texts that we can offer and, and bring in, right? Um, and then the, the kind of subsequent question, which is, is how do we then teach, teach it in a responsible way, right? Understanding that, that we might not have the training 
um, necessary um, to to do that. And I think I think um, Odin, your 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 comments really really speak to to that kind of process. Um, I think that you know I I, I adore Tuck and Yang's essay. I think it's it's a, every time I read it, I'm challenged again um, <laughs> and again and again. And in what yeah, this I'll looks never like, start reading it. <laughs> what this looks like and means. Um, and I think that that the there is a, a tendency, right, in in to think about like decolonization as as this this kind of vanishing horizon as the, as the thing that, that we, we can't quite, quite get to or do, um, or that's, that's hard to imagine. And so I think my, my, the way that I've been struggling with that is to think about what can I do less that's about decolonizing the field, which is too big, but rather what can I do to shift relations um, and power structures in the place where I'm at, right? And how can I then scale that up or move that around in, in different kinds of places. So what does that look like when I'm working with a cohort of people in, in, in and displaying the Victorian classroom? What does it look like in my own classrooms, depending on the constituency of students that are there? What does that look like when I'm talking to my department? What does that look like when I'm talking to um, my fellow settler neighbors? What does that look like when I'm, I'm reaching out um, and working with local communities? All of those things I think are shifting and moving, right? But it, it's like, how do I stay mindful of, of what the, the, the dynamics of the relations are in that? And how am I moving not to center myself, but, but kind of really think about that question of, of indigenous futures and, and, um, and needs. So, I mean, I think that's, that's for me, one of the things that makes this more tangible for me is, is to, again, think about those, those not just local places, but like, like really hyper-local conversations that are taking place and how can I be mindful in that and envision, help envision and create something, um, something else. Um, that, so that's a, a starting point for, <laughs> for I really um, liked your attention to, to locality that you're saying, you know, I'm doing, I'm making the impact that I can and I, within the spaces that, that you have access to. And I think thinking of it as, you know, multiple local or um, community processes is, for, for me, I think it's a really, um, you know, useful way to go about it because I'm thinking of, um, I think it was a comment that you said, Hayden, actually, in relation to um, colonial modernity um, and that being constitutive of this practice of, and the study of English literature. But of course, um, colonial modernity is it's a fragmented practice. Not everyone experienced colonialism in the same way. And in that sense, we can't decolonize in the same way because we're attending to different needs and, and um, you know, reconciliation in, in different places, as you acknowledge with, with, the, with the treaties. Um, but yeah, great. Um, thank you. Um, Aideen, I don't know if, sorry, I jumped in to answer, uh, to respond to, to Ryan. You go ahead. No, no, um, perfect. I, I, Actually, just continuing on from, well, both your comments um, and Ryan's, I think, well, I think, I mean, Lara and I have had many conversations about the tensions between uh, decolonizing and diversifying and the complexity of actually both those, both those terms, both those practices. Um, I think, I think like, like, like you were both saying though, for me, on a personal level, um, what we're doing is is the diversifying. Um, I think the the decolonization is 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 that is that bigger work, and and for me, it's almost it's it's the institutional as well. That you know, I, I think that while we can diversify our our modules, we can diversify nineteenth uh, century studies, we can diversify our our course. Uh, even within our institutions, we can seek to maybe move against uh, diversifying within our faculties. It, 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 but it's it's a much the the work of decolonization is about it's about the spe you know the space, the institution, its practices. Um, also, I, I I think you know the, the government. <laughs> Um, you know, much much bigger work that that then I think moves as I say or points to. Um, uh, the, you know that that uh, your starting point of that decolonization then is, is not is not a metaphor. It is it is a practice, um, and it is something I think that's that's 
bigger than um, what we're doing as individuals. Um, although, of course, uh, you know, hopefully we're we're contributing uh, to, to and, and get helping uh, helping to move closer to that kind of institutional and and bigger political work that needs to happen as well. Um, <clears throat> Emma, do, would you like to? Yeah. Emma, I think you are muted. Sorry. Carrie, you can go right ahead. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's very far to be question, but my sense is that we shouldn't stop decolonizing diversifying, we should just carry on. But like one thing, like uh, um, we should probably be careful is not to be replicating, reinforcing these like uh, like uh, old assumptions as we try to diversify. So it was quite interesting. <clears throat> Ryan talked about the position of the, the like uh, scholars with the colors. So like uh, like we are being showcased, for example, like uh, uh, so diversifying is not just a kind of like uh, making up the number machine that that's the different phases, but actually it should be really truly uh, decolonizing what we do and what we, how we think about it. It's a very difficult thing to do. Yeah, so that should be a very collective effort, I think. I just want to add one thing to, to the conversation too, um, Emma. It's like, I think part of the challenge to think through, <clears throat> especially for us, is what this works, work looks like um, for literary scholars and, and scholars in the humanities. Um, I think that a lot of the literature on what this work looks like and how it's ethical is, is, has come out of um, the, the social sciences. Um, and so what, what that, that what the kinds of obligations look like, what the work, what what relations mean, and how they're built, um, is very concrete <laughs> in a way that that can be more difficult as as we especially when we think about our our producing our scholarship. It's like well, like I don't do field work, right? But what what does what is my version of field work? Um, in that sense, I, I think um, Alice Tapunga Somerville's uh, short essay, neither quantitative nor qualitative has been a real um, inspiration and kind of balm for me <laughs> um, to think about kind of like, you know, she talks very frankly about no, no community, no member of her, her Maori community is coming up to, and asking her for a reading of a poem. Um, this is not like, this is not something that the community needs. It's not gonna lower, you know, health disparity rates in, 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 her, in her community. And yet, you know, what are the ways that she's seeing herself connected and, and, and part of doing that work? Um, and so, um, yeah, so I think that this is, this is an especially challenging and, and pressing question for, for those of us who engage in literary criticism as well, and, and what, what is the role of that? And, and I guess I, I would say part of how I'm grappling with that is thinking about, um, again, you know, I'm not trying to establish myself as the authority in my research. The goal is not like, how do I showcase the model or develop the thing that's going to fix this in Victorian studies, but how does my work create space for Indigenous futures within Victorian studies? That's the question I want to grapple with and think about. Is there a way that that my my work is creating space rather than you know for future scholars who will hopefully fast outstrip me, um, who are indigenous scholars, then 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 kind of closing things down or finishing a discussion or, or, or topic. Yeah, great. I think thinking about the, the longevity and the futurity of this project is essential um, because we, you know, I was saying to Chloe earlier, you know, we're not going to diversify Victorian studies in this two hour colloquium, but it's a start, isn't it? And it's hopefully giving people kind of um, inspiration and ideas to move forward. I have plenty more questions for you all, but I'm actually going to pass over to Chloe because I know she'll definitely have something to say about Punka Silverville's um, article that you just referenced. So, but yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Emma. Um, yeah, just to echo uh, what Emma said, thank you so much to all the speakers for your incredible papers. Um, and thank you so much, um, Lara and the IES as well for including me in this. Um, it's a real honor to be involved. I'm at quite a sort of rudimentary level uh, with my research. Um, and as a student trying to sort of diversify and begin to, uh, to decolonize um, my own work in Victorian studies and to extend um, so much theory towards a method, um, which can be a really sort of nebulous and back 
backwards process um, in these early research stages, this sort of conversation is so useful for me. Um, yeah, I, uh, I I look a lot at my in my work at contemporary anthropology, um, and uh, Tapunga Somerville's essay certainly speaks to I think um, some of the kind of diverse ways that like Ryan's touched upon the sort of social sciences are at a very different stage um, with imagining their kind of, um, you know, their, their paradigms, their telos, their objects, their modes of practice, um, and their sort of relationality and researcher standpoint in ways that um, literary studies are really kind of beginning to grasp, um, you know, as and as Aideen sort of talked about the kind of um, 19th century colonial history of English literature as a discipline, um, anthropology, obviously a, a deeply um, Victorian colonial uh, science, um, kind of founded on uh, the basis of trying to establish uh, reasons for human variation um, that spoke very much to kind of um, uh, imperial um, imperial process and imperial notions of, of, um, of others. Um, and I think that anthropology has it sort of for the last half century really been grappling with its own origin story and its own modes and practices um in a way that you just don't see in 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 literary studies um which has led to these really productive and fruitful new avenues with it which it engages with now um so just to touch on briefly kind of uh, what Emma's already spoken to, a common theme across your work is um, the sort of centering of these hegemonic paradigms about what constitutes Victorian literary culture and the lenses we invoke to frame it. Um, and reaching beyond our own fields is, um, you know, paramount to this work. Victorian studies is sort of historically quite an insular field. Um, and I'm particularly struck by the kind of productive potential that Aideen touched upon of invoking Indigenous um, lenses, for instance, to address issues beyond race and empire and thinking, for instance, about what indigenous perspectives on Britishness and British culture might generate. Um, and your talks have touched on a really diverse number of ways that you're working to foreground histories and, and cultures of indigenous black and other non-European peoples um, in your work through teaching and this collectivizing action through network building and diversifying the canon. And it's really illuminating to hear you break down some of the practical steps that are involved with this work um, and putting these, um, these kind of impulses into action. Um, and challenging um, the kind of Eurochronologies of Victorian studies and the normative periodizations and conceptualizations of the long, long standing literary histories of the British world um, that have historically been the recognized boundary of the field and reaching towards um, kind of English language, translated, transliterated literary cultures um, from the 19th century uh, seems, uh, you know, a really productive way of, of establishing this. And, You've each raised a number of really interesting points about pursuing method. Um, I'm particularly struck by the potential for this unsettling of relationships and a kind of unsettling of um, unsettling a kind of key notion that Alice Tumunga Somerville also touches upon a lot in her work about unsettling the canon. Um, but unsettling kind of institutional relationships seems to be a really um, interesting way into beginning to establish some of this work and I wonder if Aideen or Kauri if maybe you could speak about this and whether or not this has been a kind of um, something that you've considered within your research practice um, kind of within British institutions Ryan's already touched upon this with such eloquence about um, working within an American uh, context but I wonder whether or not this is something that you've thought about um, those working um, yeah within within British universities at all. Sure, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I think there's a real um, tension, particularly at the moment, um, and perhaps even more so than when I first started working in, in Kingston University about uh, 10 or 11 years ago. Um, a, a sort of gre greater tension even now, uh, even more so now, about um, a, kind of a willingness from the institution uh, to decolonize or diversify whichever term they're using and of course the real practical work that needs to happen for that to happen uh, in any real sense um, and one of the things that um, I'm really and have been grappling with uh, over my time here is that um, 
as we get, uh, Kingston is a very uh, diverse <laughs> institution. My students uh, are, you know, in, in English studies um, are uh, from a huge variety of backgrounds, um, both in terms of ethnicity, uh, race, class, you know, you know across the board, religion. You know, it's, it's a wonderful institution for that. Um, but it becomes, um, like many other institutions, increasingly white as we go up through, uh, you know, even in terms of between our first year students to our third year students, you know, the students who, who make it through to finish the undergrad. And then that dramatically shifts when we come to MA uh, students and PhD students. Um, and uh, trying to affect change there is, is really, really difficult. Um, you know, we we started by um, in the English department, we started our uh, diversifying practices with it with a project um, funded by the university on on, um, you know, the difference it makes to the attainment gap, you know, again, using the language to the attainment gap when we when we do have a more diverse curriculum um, and and that, you know, as, as we all know, of course, you know, it, 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 may, it does make a difference. Students are, you know, uh, students from diverse backgrounds will engage with a more diverse curriculum. They feel more part of the institution. They're more willing to, to remain engaged with, with the university as, as a whole. Um, we also uncovered, of course, that there's lots of other factors there. So such as, you know, um, this, again, the space itself, like we have a lot of uh, students who, cannot uh, uh, socialize in spaces that serve alcohol so where do we create spaces for those students to, to congregate um do we make actually enough spaces for those students um so uh you know so around, you know it, it's obviously more than just the, the 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 curriculum of course um but we're really struggling um and i think ryan mentioned this too when it comes to postgraduate work and that's partly because of the increasing strictures on kind of funding and so on, uh, you know, our, our more, our diverse student body, um, I think still feel that, still find it harder to, to fund, first of all, when it comes to MA studies. Um, uh, and also are less inclined to see academia still as a, as a, as a profession for them. Um, and um, it, the, Again, trying to get the university to make real changes to that is very difficult because that's about money. <laughs> um, it's about money. It's about, um, you know, challenging um, bigger structures. Um, they have for the first time this year, we've, we have got a PhD, some PhD scholarships um, that are specifically for uh, students of colour. Um, Again, I'll be really interested to see how how sustainable, how long that lasts, whether this is a lip service um, thing that's happening this year or whether it will be ongoing. Um, so, yes, I think I think there are, you know, this, this, there is this tension between on some levels, the university wanting to claim and to celebrate what's happening within individual departments and yet still not quite putting that into practice them, themselves. Yeah, um, okay, so, yeah, I, I think, like, uh, Kendo is a very good place to do the, decolon like, uh, do the decolonizing and also diversifying curriculum because I'm, like, uh, well, like, I did my PhD in the post-colonial studies. So we have a big center with the post-colonial studies. And then, like, uh, and we have, uh, like, a new indigenous, like, study centers. And also, I, I'm quite keen to do, and like, I, I'm like, like um, Emma, like I do human animal relationships. And they let, they were, actually, they let me do all these things. And so, like, Kent is quite like a wonderful place, like, all sorts of things happening. And then it's almost like it's more difficult to keep the Victorian studies as it is, because, like, now, like, funding. So, as Ryan said, like, we are being kind of trying to merge with uh, that intersection between social sciences or sciences. So, we have to actually, now that the kind of field is so moving so quick, fast. So, it's quite like an interesting time to think about it. Yeah. Uh, so, a student, like, uh, I, 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 I feel more and more students are like less white in Kent. And actually it's really lovely because like, it's quite fun to teach. Like, uh, um, 
was the point of issues for people from Mauritius and from different places contributing to it. Yes, um, yes, funding and also things we have even talked about is an issue, but and we are really like uh, worried about our job because humanities fund is going. But still, I think it's a very exciting time to be thinking about decolonizing curriculum because it's so moving so fast, I think. Right. Um, I think, yeah, I think there are tensions on different scales in the institution, aren't there? There's what, what, what we do as academics in the department and, and how far the institution resources that. Um, and, you know, like there, there, there's, there, there is, as you say, at, Cal at Kent, a lot of really, really good, good stuff being done at the, at the scale of the school or, 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 or the division, um, you know, working cross-disciplinary. Um, but, but the question of resource allocation that you touched on, Nadine, um, I think is a, is, is, is a big one. It's really interesting that your institution was happier, was happy to fund uh, work into looking at the attainment gap, which is a very contentious term in itself and relates to the kind of neoliberal ideas of marketization and retaining as many students as possible. So th that was just so telling um, that that was something they were interested in investing in. Um, I thought, but yeah, great, great to hear about the scholarships and um, be interesting to hear how those go up, go on. Yeah, we've got some scholarships at Kent that Emma's pointing out that are oriented towards Indigenous scholars, the Lipman Scholarship. Um, so yeah, we are trying to do work in that direction. Uh, David was here, David Stirrup, who's the director for the Centre for Indigenous and Settler Colonial Studies at Kent, but I don't know if he's still, still here uh, and wants to come in. Um, before we return, yeah, hi, David, do you want to go come in and say more? I don't have much to add. I mean, I, I really enjoyed this conversation. It's been fantastic. Um, but yeah, I mean, on that question of decolonization, I think I think the point I might make is is the starkness of the difference between what we mean by it and what the institution means by it, as in what senior management mean by it. Those two things are very different, and they don't talk to us, and they won't listen when we try to talk to them. So I think that overcoming that barrier, breaking that frame, to use Ryan's uh, phrase is the big one for us at Kent uh, to, to turn to you know to, to actively transform the incredibly good work being done by academics and students into something that the institution actually understands and can adequately support. Yeah that's that's a really really excellent point. I mean there's so many great under David's leadership, there, there are so many great student projects as well emerging, and yeah, making them legible to the institution in in, in that uh, in terms that they value is, is a difficult one. We've got a couple of things in the chat that I'm just going to bring in here. Uh, one comment from Nicola, which says um, she's grateful to Carrie for the emphasis on how we read and genre alongside what we read. I wonder if developing a diversifying ways of reading toolkit might be a helpful, method, method, a helpful methodological aspect of this collective endeavor. What might we add to this, including the shifting genre of fables? So diversifying genre um, and form um, as, as, as part of a, maybe an idea for a reading group. Um, I like that, I love that as an idea. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. Uh, Vicky's got, um, uh, a reflection. From, from my own reflection on this topic, at Royal Holloway, our founder, Thomas Holloway, is a type, type of the self-made man, and institutional messages can reinforce entrepreneurship. There may be decolonizing opportunity to unthink the power of dynamics of individualism on which it is based, and promote collectivism, listening, cooperation as a rebalancing endeavor. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'd be interested if you've got any reflections on that, making that legible to management at Royal Holloway. Um, so it goes, uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah. You've muted yourself, Lara. Sorry, if anyone else has got any comments, questions or things they want to raise, please raise your hands or, or put them in the chat. Um, Isabel. Uh, thank you all for this uh, amazing uh, afternoon, evening. Um, it, it's, a, it's a terrific discussion. Um, I, I uh, wanted to just say something about our students, um, whatever composition they are. I think that um, one of the things we need to do is to rely on their own creativity in unfreezing, you know, uh, traditional colonial uh, readings and positions and so on. 
Um, I, I'm, I'm actually not clear whether in literary criticism, we, we're not always in a sense representational. I'm not sure about how to get out of that, that sort of block. But what I do think is that we should give students many more opportunities, not just for critiquing and, and so on, but for actually actively reading these texts. I, I was thinking of a, a time uh, when I was in America and teaching actually white students, um, Jane Eyre. And of course the crux is Bertha, isn't it? It's, it's, it's the, uh, um, and in England, the crux would be, I think, perhaps rather different. Um, but the way, the way we did that novel was actually not to write at all. We actually interpreted it through the students' own drawings and uh, constructions and, and so on. And um, what, what was fascinating to me is the, the sort of insights that that kind of creativity produced. And in terms of Bertha, um, one group of students aware of Jane Eyre's extraordinary drawings that you remember in the earlier phases of the novel she shows to Rochester, they actually did a whole series of Bertha's drawings, what she would do both in her captivity and before. And they, from this, kind of learnt a fantastic amount, I think, about the novel itself, about issues of colonialism, decolonizing, etc. cetera. Um, and I, I think that, you know, we need to kind of tack, have confidence in our students' own um, creativity and, and independence, intellectual independence. Um, otherwise, I think we can become kind of slightly coercive and, and, and produce this, this sort of slightly accusatory history, uh, which is very tempting to do um, and almost inevitable in some ways. But I think getting out of that bind is actually asking the students to be creative. That's all I have to say. Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting. I mean, certainly I see this a lot in my in, in my own department is people um, turning towards practice-based modes of assessment that, that encourage exactly that. And yeah, because I mean, ine inevitably, it, it, every, every moment we move beyond teaching in the classroom, don't we? Um, and, and we have moments where students give, bring something that Absolutely. comes from their own experience that um, we move beyond pedagogy that, 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 that engages with that creativity in their particular um, frame of frames of reference and uh, yeah thinking of more I mean I'm not I'm not by nature a practice-based person uh, scholar but um, so I find that challenging but incorporating those different modes of assessment more more practice more creative best is certainly something I've been thinking about across across my modules and I'm sure many other people have here as well um, but yeah I think it's, it's a really important point to raise. Um, Gail has said in the chat um, at Reading, a PVC and the diversity dean have led a race review across the institution, which now has a mandate to look at stroke activate diversity across a range of areas. The lead from the top is very helpful, but a potential danger is that disciplinary knowledge and expertise might not be recognised. Yeah, this is this sort of loops back to David Stewart's point about how do we make uh, disciplinary knowledge legible to the to leadership, uh, disciplinary knowledge that moves outside of uh, your European frames of reference and, and, and knowledge production. Okay, Laura Gill says, I was going to ask a question about practically accessing texts beyond the canon, especially for students from low income backgrounds. I've been wanting to teach the woman of colour a tale, but struggling to find editions that are affordable for my students. The conversation prompted me to have another look and I've now found a PDF transcribed by students and staff at Marymount University. A good example of the kind of project that can open up teaching materials. <laughs> I feel like Dino Felugia might say it's on code, but yeah, not everyone has access to code because that is not open access. One of the things we're going to be doing, and that's this is a great time to mention it actually, so thank you for that, Laura, and I'll add that, is we're putting together a resources page, which is going to include uh, projects we know of um, that, that think about pedagogy, um, diversifying, widening, and disciplining the field, but also open access texts. Because I know many of us come across texts in our research and, our, and our, our, that we want to use, but we don't know where to find them. And then there's so many great projects going on, some of them done by students, some of them just done by, done by enthusiasts from particular communities or, 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 or from particular teaching backgrounds. So, yeah, um, we're going to put together this page. And so if anyone has any ideas, texts they teach that are open access, 
um, that, that, that we can add to this resource page, please, please email me. That's, that's really great and important point. Um, I think yeah. right now David has a, his hand up. Yeah, David. Hello, I was just gonna I was just gonna very cheekily add to add to Gail's point uh, because that happened at our place as well. But but it went one stage further because they went to external consultants. Never mind talking to expertise within the institution. They they paid another an external body, none of whom were academics, um, to to do that work for them. Um, I think it's really important actually that we do hold our senior management to account. Uh, on precisely those kinds of issues. Yeah, that was really extraordinary, wasn't it? Um, yeah, Gail. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, well, David, that sounds hideous. Um, we, we haven't gone external at Reading, largely because there's a very bruising experience of having done that in a different context a few years before I got there. Um, and it's it's a genuine it's a genuine attempt by by leadership to do the right thing. Um, but the trouble is that one of the results of this is that the central teaching unit. CQSD, and I can't remember what that stands for, is now in charge of decolonizing curricula across the university, which fills me with absolute horror because we're the people doing the work. Um, but it's 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 a good intention, I guess, but it's one I think that as, as academics we need to, to kind of hold on to without being too um, territorial about it. But I, I did, I was just writing to Laura to say that I'm I'm one of the organizers of English Shared Futures, and we have got a couple of spaces still on the program. So if if a bunch of you guys would like to come along and present, then we've got a really broad range of people coming along beyond the Victorian period. And we've got lots of school teachers coming too on this Saturday, the 9th of July. So um, it's it's plug, it's plea, um, if you'd like to come, I think that, that would be a great space to, to really advertise what you're doing. And other periods I think would benefit from the work that a lot of you have been doing already. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's a really, really uh, generous offer. Well, I've been thinking about that because English Shared Futures, I know, is a fantastic event um, and a great space to bring together educators uh, from from higher education and and school and and school teaching. So, um, yeah, def definitely something to think about. Jessica says in the chat, this discussion has been wonderful. Thank you. Just one thing to add, ask. Much of today's discussion is focused on the US and UK academia for understandable reasons. But our response, our responsibilities to scholars and students in places that are subject to other forms of empire and, and oppression today. I speak as someone formerly based in Hong Kong, but there are many other examples as, as, as well. Jessica, do you want to say a bit more about the, the Hong Kong context, if you're here? Um, yes. Can you see and hear me? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I just wanted to bring up scholars outside of the, the Atl Atlantic academia. Um, I know from my experience, um, there's a way in which they often are forgotten um, because of the time difference, because of the discussions that happen. And I'm wondering what are our responsibilities to scholars who are in places like Hong Kong or now Ukraine or, or Russia who are subject to oppression um, and to contemporary empires that may work in ways that are quite different than the kind of imperial forms that we study um, in the 19th century. Um, particularly, how can we perhaps include scholars and students um, that are not based in the US and the UK? And how can we introduce scholarship that is based outside and that might have a different kind of framework in the way that it approaches um, uh, approaches these ideas. Um, and one specific example would be, for example, um, uh, conceptions of race, right, will vary uh, based on the particular contextual uh, history. Um, so, for example, U.S. Um, conceptions of race do, do not necessarily import themselves cleanly into Hong Kong. Um, so I, I wonder if there are ways that we can also open up this discussion and also diversify, not just um, in the very important sense of um, opening up the canon and the way we teach in the UK and the US, but also opening up geographically as well. Any thoughts on that from anyone? I'll just say I think it's crucial. <laughs> I think it's it's deeply crucial um, on, on all the levels that you're talking about. I mean, I think that there's there's a level of, of just thinking about um, 
solidarity solidarity politics with with other scholars in in, in colonized spaces. Um, and so, um, you know, you're talking about Hong Kong, you're talking about Ukraine. Um, I think, you know, we, we could bring in, in Palestine as well here, right? Like thinking about um, the ways in which the the historical realities that we're focused on as, as Victorianists are ongoing realities that have been shaped by Victorian realities, right? Um, so, I mean, these, these things are not, not, not distant for us. So, I mean, I think about, I think that's crucial. Um, and then I also th really think about your point about um, our citational politics. I mean, I think that, 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 um, that are of course reified by multiple different kinds of structures, right? Not including just database subscription, right? And, and lack of open access and, and the difficulties of, of accessing, um, you know, the work of scholars from the global South, um, the ways in which Victorianism is still very much a monolingual field. Um, and so what does it mean to, to engage that? So, I mean, um, yeah, so that's been a big part of my process too, is just trying to figure out like for my own scholarship, like what are folks writing in, in in other places that are not just the you know the the usual presses the usual you know and, and how do I I kind of track down that those citations and Laura and I have talked about this this uh, a lot before that that's a real challenge but but it's crucial work I mean it's it's really really crucial work and and um, and how, it, as a way of disrupting I think the the kind of citational inertia. Um, of privileging um, the global north and and especially kind of Euro-American frames. I think that's 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 really really important. So thank you for bringing it up, Jessica. Yeah, we just echo that. Um, it it is uh, crucial um, and difficult. <laughs> um, uh, and again, I think there's also uh, again we're constantly working within. Um, that again, an, another tension <laughs> between wanting to, to address the specifics, you know, of our of our locations, our fields, of, of, of our research, of our histories, um, of our students. But at the same time, um, I think learning from other disciplines, other fields, other um, other spaces, other places, other other texts. Um, and I guess that's I, this is again this ongoing collaborative, inclusive, um, equal equal work that we that we that we want to be that we want to do. Um, that it's it's not about sort of uh, or trying to I suppose um, displace a more traditional model of a kind of top down experts from elite institutions kind of you know passing down work and and you know then that um uh, great uh, quote that ryan just sort of gave us uh, of citational inertia um of producing that um uh, and and really you know engaging in a, in a process that is a, really about constantly remembering that we're that we are always learning um and even coming back to the to um, the point about, about students is that we're always learning from our students in the classroom every single time we teach. <laughs> um, and more and more, I think, um, or at least I feel like more and more of my colleagues when I speak to them, you know, we are trying to find ways of teaching that, that allow, again, more space for that, uh, for, for learning uh, from our students. And, and every, every year, every new group of students brings different conversations to, to the same text that we that we teach. Um, and, and of course we want, you know, we, we, we also need to learn from students in, in, yeah, in other spaces and places as well. So yes, absolutely, basically. Yeah, uh, me too as well. Um, I'm very interested in like, uh, how to engage with other languages too. And the one thing which Victorians did much better than us is that they operated in different languages. They learned, like, actually, to go to India, they learned like, other languages. It's amazing. They had to, like, uh, and then which we lost, we just operated in English or French, the major languages. So I think, like, uh, kind of, like, this, like, uh, be more multilingual, like, uh, uh, be more kind of, not just translation, try to engage with other languages. Is should be a part of the diversifying the mm. curriculum, I think. Yeah, and, and, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll just add too. I mean, I think a, a piece of this is is learning um, 
where this work lives in other institutional contexts. So, I mean, we already kind of talked about uh, the institutional trajectories of indigenous studies have, have been largely through um, the social sciences and education, um, the field of education in, in other locations. So it's like, it's like going beyond even just like literary, traditional literary scholarship to figure out, you know, how do we make the, that interdisciplinary move, right, to something where if there's an institutional context that's, that's really different, right, of, about where, where I'm even needing to look for work, um, I think is a, a, a key part of this as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that point, that point about multilingualism, I was looking for Paul Fife, um, who I know was here earlier, who was, ran a workshop on multilingualism in periodicals. Um, yeah, it's interesting, the politics of collaboration, um, because across European languages, there's a lot of willingness for collaboration. There's a lot of people. I mean, I was told very early on when looking at South Africa, I couldn't, I couldn't look at South African print culture without learning some Dutch, which I have done, but my Dutch is still terrible. And I can do some back translating, but, you know, not much more than that. I, I mean, I need Dutch speaking colleagues and, and scholars to, to help out with that. And I need to be very honest and transparent about that when working with that archive. Um, but building the, with those those collaborations with European scholars is a very different type of work from building those or, or thinking about how those collaborations might or might not operate with scholars from non-European cultures, um, where the, the power dynamics are different um, in the relationship and more trust has to be built for collaboration to take place. So there, there are lots of kind of interesting questions around the multilingualism um, and the limitations of monolingualism, I think. Yeah, we've got another uh, couple of comments in the chats that have come in. Academic language has a power structure which places a further obstacle stroke set of traumas in the way of achievement and success for many students. To have a truly diverse classroom, we need to examine our pedagogies to ensure we don't reproduce or reinforce inequalities in classroom practice, absolutely. I loved Ryan's description of the ways in which he began to a module by looking at his, their positionality. Isabel's point about diversifying assessment is important too. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. Do you want, do you want to say any more about that, Vicky? Hi, sorry, I'm going to try and turn the video on, but I've got, got kids around me. Is it there? Is there? Hello. Hello. And um, I just want to say thank you so much. And it made me think about decolonization as a practice. You know, it, 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 everything you've given me today. And I knew it was a process of self-reflection and review. But what I'm taking away today is to externalize that and to make it a co-creative practice as well when I'm thinking about what I'm doing in the classroom and with my institution as well. So thank you very much yeah it's just really reinforcing and affirming all of the great things i've i've heard and will take away thank you thank you thank you so much vicky i mean this is one of many conversations that will be ongoing uh, manvela yes hello i just wanted to um reiterate um what uh, what vicky just said this for me was a wonderful experience i want to thank you all for your extraordinary uh just generosity to share all of this very hard work and very time consuming work. Um, it, it encouraged me so very much. Um, I, I've been teaching Victorian literature for almost two uh, decades and I'm about to restructure entirely for a PhD MA level class. And I have been following since 2020 and the, that manifesto um, on the, um, I think it was the Los Angeles uh, book, review of books. And I have been, you know, gathering all this information. And, and it's it's just extraordinary how much you've all together offered this community who, who wants to join you in, in practicing, uh, putting this into practice. And, and I was very encouraged also by all of the suggestions that we just allow ourselves to not know how and to you know to to reach out uh, to ask for help and to include the students i think that's essential because after a couple of decades of teaching you you do realize that you know your students have perspectives and are familiar and, and comfortable with things you may not be so it, this was extraordinary for me i appreciate all of you so much and thank you for for sharing thank you very much for that Manuela. that's that's really Really lovely to hear. Chloe and Emma, have you got any final thoughts and reflections um, before we close for the evening? Um, I have, I mean, I have a 
a lot more questions um, to ask all of you individually, but um, there's one there's one thing that has been kind of recurring in my um, as I've been sort of listening to you all about um, the kind of the kind of sort of normative mindset, perhaps, of what as academics we are expected to um, to have and to kind of to present versus this constant process that we are actually all in, which is learning and relearning and unlearning. Um, and particularly when um, you're sort of moving towards invoking kind of indigenous knowledge, which is a, which is a, a form of knowledge that as outsiders and outsider academics, you can have no, no sort of inherent knowledge of. Um, that this kind of sort of, it, it, is it sort of, as academics, this, this actually kind of goes against, um, <laughs> this is kind of an unnatural process. And there's this expectation for, acad for academia in general and academics that we are kind of omniscient um, and that there's a, a sort of facade of pervasive knowledge that is constantly kept up and maintained. And it's sort of institutionally expected. And on a sort of basic level, it's kind of expected that we'd be able to represent an entire field when we are applying for jobs. And our ability to kind of present this external facade is um, is so institutionalized. Um, but the kind of work that we've been discussing today really involves this um, this kind of return to very hum to sort of to be humble and to constantly actually point to the fact that we don't know and we can't know and we are always learning. And I wonder whether or not. Um, there's a kind of institutional change that needs to happen here and whether or not this is going to be a culture change or I don't know whether this is something that any of you have kind of reflected on much as you've been exploring these processes in your own work, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think I think there is, I'm hopeful, should I put it, maybe I'll put it that way, I'm hopeful that there is a, a slight tidal change <laughs> Uh, in, uh, at least among academics, I, I feel that um, there's increasing resistance to things like sort of the language of, of excellence, you know, that, that we're expected to conform to as academics. Um, you know, obviously, we're seeing it in the UK at the moment with, you know, industrial action that's taking place, which is a lot to do with workloads, but it's also to do with obviously pay, pay gaps. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, casualization of labor. So all you know, big eth ethical concerns as well. Um, but I think it is also to do with with um, with exactly what you're talking about, Chloe. You know, th this sense in which we are expected all the time to be excellent, expert, you know, omniscient um, uh, uh, individuals. Um, and I, as I say, I see, I see the, the industrial action as, as partly a pushback against that. I see also amongst my own colleagues a much greater, um, again, uh, tendency towards sharing our um, failures. I'm going to put that in very commas, but you know, when uh, um, uh, sharing the, the, time, the times when we don't get the funding, which, as we all know, is, is way more often than the times that we do. Um, of, of really being more open, honest, and, and frank um, about, um, about, you know, the amount of work, the amount of labor that it takes to, to, have, to have any uh, success. Um, and a pushback, I think, against some of the metrics, you know, um, which intensify that language around excellence and expertise. Um, you know, obviously, how far again institutions are listening? I'm not. I'm not sure, but I, I do see. I think amongst my peers, my colleagues, um, uh, you know, people starting to push back against that. Um, yeah, I mean, I just to kind of dovetail on this, and, and I'm afraid I'm going to have to run off <laughs> very quickly here because I have to teach in, in ten minutes. Um, but I mean, I think you know, part of the way that I've grappled with this, Chloe, in in my own work is. Um, how can I, I think about it less in, in, in like in less solipsistically and like, oh, I can't do this and like, I, you know, like produce that, right? Rather than, and position it more as, um, you know, what I'm citing is what has been shared with me through publication or through through contact, right? That, that, that there's a way of, of centering, I think the agency 
of the particular communities and scholars that that this is knowledge that that, that they're they're making available, right? That then I, I'm engaging with, um, and that's been an important move for me um, to to then also say like that that there are things that I I won't know and that I can't know, but that I'm going to be basing you know my my own readings or my own engagement or my own analysis off of you know what's been sh been shared with me, right? And so it's it's thinking about that production of knowledge, thinking about the relations through which people produce this, right? Um, and then kind of my own positionality in that. That's just been a, a kind of really important strategy for, for me as I, I think about how to be as, as least extractive as I can be on, on this. <laughs> right. um, so so th thank you very much, everyone. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I have to duck out, but thank you so much. Great, great to see you, Ryan. And thank you so much for coming again. And we'll, we'll talk more very soon. Yeah, like, uh, I think like the recently, like, uh, there's so many things happening in the UK universities. And then, like, and then well, I, I'm blessed with a very wonderful colleague like Lara and David. But sometimes, like, re recently, actually, like, uh, uh, much, it's, I'm being kind of, like, encouraged by the people outside of the university of home. It's mm. much easier to get in touch with each other <laughs> by... Uh, <laughs> Thanks to the, in a sense. So it is I've seen more camp people here than I have do on most days, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. So it was wonderful that the like, Lara and yeah, they like, taking initiative to create this network. I think, yeah, so we have to like work within and also without like other institution to like, yeah. So to yeah, to decolonize yeah. and then and also encourage each other. <laughs> yeah. I think we, we academic needs that. Working within and without the institution, I think is such a beautiful way of putting it. <laughs> Emma, any 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 final thoughts, questions? And... Yes, I do. Well, I have a lot, but uh, I'm only going to go with one because I know everyone probably wants to get the tea or the lunch, depending on where we are. Um, my thoughts and kind of question is based upon the longevity of, of this colloquium and the work, fascinating work that um, Aideen Cowery and other people here might be doing today. Um, and part of that is thinking about how, because we've spoken a lot about the teaching element and what we do in the classroom and our work with schools. I'm thinking about the research side um, and how we put this or how we disseminate our, our findings. Um, and this kind of comes from a conversation that Chloe and I were having a few weeks ago about the um, the difficulties we'd had working as Victorian studies scholars and also Indigenous studies scholars, where some journals had rejected on the basis that there's no theory in this article, when really it was Indigenous knowledges that wasn't being valued as theory, or, you know, the flip side, where it's two Victorians to go in a, in a particular journal. Um, and I don't expect anyone here to have, you know, an answer to this problem. I'm just thinking about how can we tackle the silos that our research is expected to exist within um, and if there's any suggestions to, to how to go about this moving forward so that um, the work that we're doing within the institution can then reverberate outwards. Yeah, it's, 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 a, really, <laughs> it's a really great uh, question and, and a really difficult one. And I think, um, I think it really speaks to actually a lot of what's at, this, at the center of what we've been talking to today that often what we find is that um, if, if we're working, if you work within 19th century studies, but you're maybe working slightly outside of the canonical space, then you you often don't fit into um, uh, particular journals or uh, conferences or, 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 or yeah, some of the, the more traditional spaces. Um, I think as well, I've again spoken with a lot of colleagues and they see this happening quite often as well with the REF as um, too, um, where um, scholarship on, again, indigenous writers or writers from marginalized community, people don't really under, understand it. They don't know how to, you know, rank it. <laughs> Um, because they don't understand or, or, or struggle to grapple with where the originality lies or what is the particular work that you're that you're doing. Um, I don't really have a solution to this uh, currently, but it is something um, that's very that has been occupying my thoughts quite a lot um, as I'm sort of working on on new research and thinking about where to place or what publishers you know to, to go with. Um, 
and yeah it, it's a, it's a difficult question it's sort of an ethical question it's it's also a practical question um yeah as i said i don't have any easy answers but again it's it's something that i think um we should probably take into for, further conversations because i think it's it's something that many of us are are thinking about and, and are struggling with as well so yeah thank you for that thank you for raising I, it i think that's a great idea for a workshop yeah um because actually a lot of um a lot of journals are shifting their terrain Mm -hmm. and uh, we can be part of that by joining editorial boards and curating special issues. David, you were going to come in here. David, you've got your hands up, your hand up. Yeah, sorry, I can't operate my iPad, clearly. Um, yeah, no, I think, uh, so uh, the question that Emma just asked is something that's been playing on my mind throughout this. Um, as someone who is ostensibly an Americanist, works on contemporary writing, I've written quite a lot on 19th century writing, um, by Indigenous authors from within an Indigenous literary studies framework. Um, I doubt many people who work on Victorian literary studies will have read my material, and I've never necessarily seen myself as in dialogue with people who work in Victorian studies, and that clearly is a problem and one of the many frames that need breaking for these conversations to, to really flourish the kinds of anxieties and challenges that people have articulated today are just as live within Indigenous literary studies as they are within Victorian literary studies. So I think, you know, it's kind of a, a plea more than anything for these conversations to, to continuously push against whatever those divides are between our various kind of discursive terrains um, so, so that we can kind of negotiate these challenges together. And, and part of that, I think, will, will also involve those of you working specifically within Victorian studies, thinking about whether your materials might fit in Indigenous literary journals, for instance, um, whether there are options, whether there are opportunities for special issues of Indigenous literary journals that specifically try to tackle the the challenges of doing this work within Victorian studies frameworks. Um, so yeah, just I mean, and that's not just a pitch as someone who edits an, an open access online journal that would probably quite happily post a, a special issue like that but but it, you know it's, it is a serious point I think I think we need to be thinking about how we move across those boundaries in all sorts of ways in, uh, both in conversations like this in bringing your network into dialogue on a continuous basis with with other networks that appear on the surface to be entirely different and separate from from what you're doing and then through publishing as well yeah definitely I mean because I've certainly had I've certainly had myself lots of anxieties about the idea of approaching an Indigenous Studies journal with the sort of work I do and whether that would be welcomed by anyone. Um, so, yeah, I definitely think those conversations, um, breaking those frames is, is so important. Carrie, were you going to come in on this? Mm, no, <laughs> not really. Yeah, but... Uh... Mm, yeah, like, uh, I don't know, like, one thing that... I... I do feel sometimes like I have that kind of anxiety for working on animal studies, for example. So it's sometimes like uh, we each other, like we kind of like uh, things we talk about among animal scholars, sometimes doesn't make sense at all outside of that, like, uh, like uh, discipline, so on. So it, it's, it's like really, uh, it's the same actually, basically like we, we have, a, we kind of uh, continue to talk about it and try to, the connection with other people so that what we are discussing become more current i think yeah that's a challenge to keep to keep talking as you keep crossing the boundaries mm. yeah and i'm hoping that your network is going to be